Welcome to another episode of South Asia Research Institute for Minority Podcast. I am your host, Heman Da, Senior Research Associate at SARIM. And today we have the privilege of speaking with an exceptional researcher and advocate for social justice, Kristina Piriyat Anuja. Kristina's journey has been nothing short of extraordinary, taking her across continents from India to China, Singapore and Netherlands. In her recent 30 plus years of experience, she has engaged with diverse stakeholders, clients and collectives, leaving a profound impact every step from her roles as an external relations advisor at the Shell headquarters to her invaluable contributions as a business advisor to the country chair of Shell China. Christina has always been driven by her passion for making a positive change. Currently, she works as a consultant, skillfully bridging reams of caste based diversity, equity, and inclusion, while also lending her expertise to internal and external communications, organizational effectiveness, and accountability frameworks for both corporate and non-profit. As a convener and the founder of member of the Global Campaign for Dalit Women, Christina has been an instrumental in building self-led and self-sustained collectives for Dalit women leaders across North India, empowering them to rise and lead. Adding her to a list of accomplishments, Christina is co-founder of Dalit History Month project and an initiative that duels into the rich historical contribution of Dalit communities, spotlighting the reliance and legacy. Her impactful writing has graced the pages of estimated publications like the Verb, Outlook, India, Gender, IT, and The Wire, where she fearlessly explores intersectional discourse between caste, gender, religion, race, community, sexuality, and mental health. Currently working on her first book, non-fiction book, Christina, Devotion to Shedding Light on the Fulfillness of Life Experienced by Dalit Women is Evident. Through her work, she seeks to amplify their struggles, trumps, and stories, giving voice to marginalized communities. Today, we have the privilege to embark on the enlightening conversation with Christina Priya Danuja, dwelling into her research experiences and insights. Her mission to bring about positive change and empowerment for minority communities are marginalized communities in South Asia is truly inspiring. Welcome, Christina. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. So without any further ado, let's dive into the enriching conversation with remarkable Christina Priya Danuja. So, Ms. Danuja, my first question to you is that your extensive experience working in multiple countries and engaging with diverse stakeholders must have shaped your understanding of social justice and caste in profound ways. How has this global journey influenced your perspectives on creating positive change at the intersection of these critical issues? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Heyman. And uh, that was a very, very kind and a very, uh, very uh, flattering introduction to my profile. Thank you so much for that. It's a true honor and a privilege to be able to have this conversation with you and with Sarim. Um, I also like to thank you for, you know, um, emailing me consistently and asking me for this, for this conversation. Thank you so very much for keeping at it. And um, I'm also very happy to hear about all the work that you are doing individually, as well as what Sarim is doing so all my good luck and love towards that um thank you so much for the question that you asked Heyman around how my global journey has essentially inspired me uh with respect to doing the work that i do um i think you know uh growing up in india in the way i did I was born in a small town called Avadi, um, which is uh, which is still part of the suburban uh, area in Chennai. Uh, Chennai is one of the four metropolitan cities in India. It's the southernmost metropolitan city. So I grew up in uh, in a in a town. Um, uh, both my parents were uh, government employees. Um, 
and I had an elder, I have an elder sister. Um, and so we were a nuclear family that grew up in a small town, a very lower middle class family. Um, in, in many ways, I, I had a, a fairly challenging childhood uh, and a fairly challenging sort of a, a growth. Um, but one thing that I'm very grateful for is the effort that my family took, particularly my parents, um, to give us the best of what they had uh, and to give us a best sort of upbringing, uh, uh, particularly with respect to, you know, access and uh, being telling us to be able to read books and um, putting us in English speaking schools, uh, just really small steps and small sort of interventions that they did really helped us in ways that mm, that were perhaps not available and are still not available for uh, the majority of Dalits in India. Uh, and so that was the start of this global journey, so to say. Um, and, you know, having worked in, um, having lived and studied and worked in Singapore, and having been in uh, worked in China as well as in India for a considerable amount of time, and then in the Netherlands, and finally here in New York City, um, I've had the I've had both challenges as well as um, as well as the privilege of knowing how other communities deal with similar challenges. So in that sense, I think I have had the access to you know knowing how people innovate even within extremely troubling, extremely challenging uh, contexts, right? Uh, we, I mean, as, as somebody who grew up in India, I might think that I am the only person who is going through the worst of it, or that Dalits are the only communities that, the only community that's going through the worst of it. Uh, it might be true uh, from certain aspects, but it is also true that there are a lot of communities across the world who are facing extremely uh, troubling situations, who are living through challenging contexts, um, whose problems are immediate and urgent and desperate. Uh, and so this global journey has definitely helped me appreciate that and it has also helped me understand how people in these communities are dealing with their problems and how are they able to discover joy, how are they able to discover healing, and how are they able to understand and articulate what resilience looks like within their own context. So I think that has been the biggest learning and privilege for me over the last many years. Um, Secondly, I think it has also given me uh, a lot of potential for partnership and uh, collaboration, right? Um, I remember during one of my first ever visits to uh, Western Europe, I was having this conversation with a colleague and um, we just, I mean, we were, it was a very casual conversation and we ended up talking about, uh, you know, our childhood and um, our social locations and um, my colleague was from a Surinamese background and um, we were able to talk about how caste sort of played a role in indentured labor uh, where people from the Indian subcontinent were taken as indentured laborers to places like Suriname and that sort of got us to talk about you know how caste discrimination is still very prevalent today and I remember uh, her mentioning that, you know, Christina, I, this is the first time I'm even hearing about caste, uh, but I have met so many Indians. I have met so many South Asians, but this is the first time ever I've heard a South Asian talk about caste. Uh, and it, it, it struck me that, you know, the reason why uh, my colleague mm, who has met a lot of South Asians has not heard about caste is because the South Asians that she met were all caste privileged, were all from upper caste. So there was no reason for them to even talk about caste. Um, 
so I think over over these few years that I've been outside of India, every time I've had a conversation with a friend or a peer or a colleague or a mentor or even a stranger for that matter, uh, whether it is a casual or a formal or a, or just a party conversation even, uh, this journey has given me the opportunity to place that nugget of information in people's minds. And um, it's, it's, it's really such, um, it was such a, a beautiful thing to see how people were willing to learn and also offer their solidarity. So that has been incredibly inspirational for me and I can't be more thankful for it. Yeah, whatever you are doing, which is really exceptional, uh, the way you, when you look back, you have moved so much and you have done so much. Is the founding the global campaign for Dalit women is remarkable initiative that aims to uplift Dalit women leaders. What inspired you to embark on this journey? And could you share some of the successes and challenges you have encountered while campaigning this course? I think one thing we need to, um, one thing I'd like to register here is that um, although I am the convener and founder member of the Global Campaign for Dalit Women, I'm just one of the four founder members. Um, the the biggest inspiration essentially is the work of the grassroots activists, is the work of the Dalit women activists who are continuing to do some groundbreaking work uh, across South Asia, that includes India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan. And these are women who are extremely under-resourced themselves. Like they themselves do not come with a lot of monetary privilege. They do not come with, um, you know, health privileges. They do not have... Um, you know, an economic infrastructure or a political infrastructure, and yet they have continued to prioritize survivors of caste violence, and they continue to do the work. Um, and by work, I mean, it would be, you know, going with the victim, sorry, going with the family of the victim or with the survivor to the police station to file a net first information report. It would be, you know, going for a rally or being part of a fact-finding exercise after an incident of caste violence. It's really their work that is that is the basis of this initiative, or for that matter, any initiative that is um, that is going on in in the Indian subcontinent. Um, my work, uh, uh, Heyman, is essentially just to be. Um, this interface between the work that these activists do in India to that of uh, international aid and funding and visibility. Because I am very uh, intent on uh, being, uh, being part of this exercise of providing them the infrastructure that they need in order to do the work. Right? Um, so there is a lot of work that's involved in, in being able to translate what they do uh, into a language that is uh, that that is accessible by the international community. Um, the work of these activists require a lot of advocacy, a lot of internationalizing, because there is a massive industry uh, that is out there that is willing to offer solidarity and partnership and collaboration. Um, and, and, and people like me who are sitting in that interface can do so much um, towards bridging this gap. Um, so that's, that's predominantly what I do and predominantly my role. So um, the real work is being done by the activists on the ground in terms of helping survivors and supporting survivors of caste violence. Um, you asked about success stories. Uh, I I can't quite um, do justice in terms of telling you uh, in as much detail as the activists would, but particularly the success stories have been with respect to what kind of compensations these activists have been able to get for the families of the victims 
as well as the survivors, um, what kind of uh, facts that they have been able to unearth during fact-finding exercises, um, as well as, you know, and, and these fact-finding exercises are particularly instrumental when it comes to incidents that are not covered by local, regional, or national media. So in that sense, uh, essentially the success um, is, is by virtue of the facts that these activists have been able to unearth and deliver reports and be able to submit it to the, uh, to the government or to the lawyer that's fighting the case. So across the board, these are the type of success stories that uh, women activists have been able to be part of. Um, and Global Campaign for Dalit Women is a relatively new initiative. Um, however, it is, uh, it is, I mean, the three other women activists that Dalit women activists that founded um, this campaign uh, come with about 20 and 13 and about 11 years of work experience. So they have been working before this campaign began, um, they were part of the All India Dalit Mahila Adhikar Manch. They were part of the Dalit Women Fight campaign. So uh, their success stories spans, uh, their success stories go beyond this campaign itself. And I definitely do invite people to look at our website, the Global Campaign for Dalit Women, gcdw.org, as well as follow the hashtag Dalit women fight, uh, which will sort of give you um, all the sort of things that they have done over a period of time, um, over the last 10 years or so, not just the last year since we had begun this campaign. So, you know, there is nothing more inspiring than the, a woman inspiring another woman to build. So as you talked about the hashtag, your dedication to the hashtag, the Dalit Month History Project is commendable mm -hmm. as it strives to the shed light on the historical contributions of Dalit communities. What motivated you to initiate this project and what valuable insight have you gained from uncovering the stories of resilience and strength within Dalit history? Yeah, yeah, such a great question. Um, again, I want to clarify that I was not the person who initiated this project. Um, I also understand that a law that April, the month where we celebrate uh, Ambedkar Jayanti, when the month when we celebrate Ambedkar Jayanti, um, is a month that has been historically celebrated. Um, you know, a lot of celebrations have happened during the month of April uh, historically within the state of Maharashtra. So a lot of Ambedkarite Buddhists and uh, Ambedkarite, the Ambedkarite community, they have been already celebrating April um, before we launched this project. Um, the the idea was brought to me by Tenmoli Sangar Rajan, who is the executive director of Equality Labs, um, who's currently the executive director of Equality Labs. So the way the project began was um, initially we had a co committee of three people working on it: myself, Tenmoli, and another person named Mari. And then eventually it became a larger collective, which we called as the Gulf History Month Collective. And now it is a community-owned project. It is a project that the entire community is part of. No one single person owns this project. So um, different types of people celebrate uh, Dalit History Month globally. Um, uh, Ambedkarites celebrate it. Dalits celebrate it. Uh, allies, anti-caste allies celebrate it. It's celebrated not just in India, but across the world, um, from Western Europe to, you know, um, um, to the Americas. So it, that's 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 the fantastic thing about this project. Um, how has this been inspirational to me? I think uh, till the time I became part of this project, till the time I started working on this project, I did not quite see our histories as something to be proud of you know so uh, i continue to see our or rather i was conditioned to see our histories as as a history of just victimhood and deprivation and desperation and nothing beyond that um now that might be true it is it is it could be true it is true that uh, a majority of um 
caste marginalized people across Pakistan and India and elsewhere are going through a terrible, terrible time and are victims of violence. All of this is absolutely true. But for one's personal, individual and collective psyche, just thinking ourselves as victims and nothing but victims is not helpful uh, when we have to think about self-determination or you know, when we want to achieve the list of dreams, uh, you know, the big dreams that you spoke of, like how do we achieve those dreams if we continue to believe that we are victims, right? So till this project happened to me, I did not quite see what a transformational um, journey I could get into. If I were to flip that thought into you know, thinking that our history is a history of resilience, our history is a history of resistance, our history is a history of celebration. Um, so that really helped me personally. And I think it uh, hopefully it has helped people collectively as well, because as part of this project, we were not just acquiring uh, data around, you know, the different atrocities that have happened. We were also looking for information and collecting data around the different milestones that the movements have achieved over the over the over the many many years um, we were also trying to highlight different people who have uh, done some fantastic fabulous stuff who continue to do some fabulous stuff for the movement we were also tracking the types of scholarships that have been put forward as far as anti-caste literature is concerned. So there was a lot of aspects within this project that really helped me, uh, as well as the collective, to, to appreciate our histories, to appreciate, and not just our histories, but also our present as well as our future. Because what was happening while we were working with Dalit History Month with the Dalit History Month project, as well as what's been happening in the last few years, is that we are also creating history in our present. Because if we were to think like 20 to 30 years from now, uh, the next generation is going to look back at the work that we are now doing. And our work is going to be part of history. So that also really kept us going. It continues to motivate uh, motivate me even as I'm writing my book. So I think um, it, it's been nothing so short of inspirational to be part of this project. And I consider it my one of my biggest um, honors ever. Might be this is the, one of the best projects you have had. Yeah, so absolutely. Your writings have explored the intricate connections between caste, gender, religion, race, sexuality, and mental health, especially. How do these identities impact the experiences of minority communities in South Asia? And what steps can we take to better understand and address these complexities? Such a great question, um, Heyman. Um, so really, I think, um, to be very honest, I feel like we have only started to scratch the surface as far as these intersections are concerned. I mean, indeed, there is a lot of scholarship and a lot of writing uh, that Dalits have put forward, Dalit women specifically have put forward and are continuing to put forward with respect to these aspects. But there is a lot more work to be done. And uh, this is something that I have I have articulated before and I continue to articulate is that we should be invested in creating a body of work, a body of scholarship that is authored by us based on our experiences, however diverse and complicated and nuanced and problematic they are. It is our responsibility and it is our calling to create this body of work. Right. So I feel like we have only started to scratch the surface with respect to, say, caste, sexuality and mental health or caste, race and sexuality or caste, race and disability or caste, sexuality and disability. So like different types of intersections, different and 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 so many of us, so many of us um, occupy these points of intersection 
like in your case, as you were uh, sharing with me earlier, you occupy a space of being in a geographical location of Pakistan. Your caste location is that of a Dalit. And your experiences are very unique compared to uh, Indian Dalits, right? Uh, but we have we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what it means to have that experience uh, because the predominant discourse, even the predominant Dalit discourse is not something that you can probably relate to or even what I can relate to. So I think um, there's definitely that aspect that needs to be covered. Um, thirdly, uh, what? how do we understand our complexities better? I think one of the things that I have been struggling with, even as I am, even as I do my writing and even as I write my book at the moment, is that I'm constantly asking myself, or rather my mind is constantly throwing this, this uh, thing at me, asking me, am I, am I going to sound problematic? Am I going to be um, too controversial? Am I going to say something that is going to offend people? Am I going to be, am I going to sway too far away from the predominant anti-caste discourse? So these are some of the questions my mind is putting forward to me. And I think that's not necessarily a very healthy way to go about writing because we have to speak our truth. The more we speak our truth, the more we stick to, uh, the more we are authentic in our storytelling about our own stories, the better it is for the world to understand our complexities the better it is for our own people to understand our own complexities because it is it is it is human to be complex and um, if a human being uh, uh, individually as well as collectively if human beings are subjected to what caste has subjected to us for thousands of years our stories are bound to be complicated our stories are bound to be complex and we have to speak our stories we have to tell our stories we have to speak our truth uh, and I think that's one of the best ways to understand our own complexities. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with that. Uh, you know, addressing caste-based DEI, as you mentioned, diversity, mm. equity, and inclusion is undoubted, uh, undoubtedly challenging yet essential. Drawing from your perspective, mm. what advice would you offer to corporates and non-profit organizations seeking effective way to navigate and promote inclusivity and fairness within their organizations? Um, I think um, I'm not so sure about Pakistan and please uh, uh, do feel free to enlighten us about you know what, how it is how is diversity, equity, and inclusion, organizational uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in Pakistan? Um, but I can speak to what's happening in India and outside of India, but particularly within the United States, um, is that uh, thanks to some of the recent initiatives that um, American Dalit and Ambedkarite organizations have been, uh, have been, have been engaged in, that uh, we are starting to talk about more seriously, we are starting to talk about caste protections and caste-based diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've, we've seen what happened with the recent Seattle ban of caste discrimination. We are also aware of what's happening in California with the State Bill 403, um, as well as uh, we know what's happening elsewhere into, at, at an organizational level Universities have come forward to um, uh, to have caste protections in place. Recently, the American Bar Association uh, put a caste protection in place. So there's a lot of work that's happening within the United States. And this, in turn, is pushing uh, this conversation around caste-based day and caste protections uh, in South Asia as well, and particularly within India. And so what we are noticing is that um, co corporates and nonprofits uh, and perhaps even academia are interested to see what they can do with respect to this space. Now, as far as India is concerned, we already have caste protections in place. 
rights, right? So we, untouchability is uh, is uh, is illegal. Um, you cannot practice um, caste law. I mean, we have the SEST Prevention of Atrocities Act in place. So we have so many such, and you also mentioned earlier on, we also have caste reservations in place. So there's a lot of stuff that's already available in India. Constitutionally, we are protected. However, at an organizational level, there are a lot of nuances and complexities that we don't take into account. And there is a lot of learning that um, uh, institutions in India can do, particularly private institutions can do when it comes to caste based day. Um, a day as a concept is an international concept. It's, 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 it was taken from the Western Hemisphere into the um, into South Asia, into India. And so day has traditionally been understood as that with respect to gender, with respect to sexuality, sexual orientation, um, age, um, they call it generation, disability, uh, you know, stuff like that, but not so much with respect to religion and caste and class. And so it is the it is it is the responsibility of um, Indian based, South Asia based uh, subsidiaries and companies and nonprofits to kickstart this conversation and to see what we need to do as far as caste day is concerned. So the real the initiative must come come from them and uh, right now that initiative is sort of emerging like we can see some ripples and you know we can see some glimpses of that interest but it's definitely not at the same magnitude or scale um, as it is or as it was um, say for queer, um, um, queer inclusivity or or even uh, you know gender for that matter. So I think there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done as far as India is concerned. And we also see a lot of interest within the United States. Um, in about a few weeks time, um, um, me and another a peer of mine, we're going to be talking to the New York Bar Association on caste protections um and caste inclusivity so um we have to continue to watch the space and see how some of these uh trends uh, particularly those that are originating in the north american region is pushing for more change within south asia yeah there are more people who started talking about and writing about the caste uh, your upcoming non-fiction book focusing on the fullness of life for dalit women sounds deeply enriching can you share with us the aspect of their lives and experiences you are exploring and what do you hope readers will take away from your work? So this is a little bit of spoiler. <laughs> wow, such a such a um, uh, an open question and uh, I don't know if I'll be able to do justice to it since I am I'm still writing my uh, book. Um, basically, this book is all about you know creating a discourse and essentially building and authoring narratives around different aspects of Dalit women's lives um and it I think that is what th that's what I've tried to do in my earlier uh, pieces of writing as well um because when I was struggling with aspects uh, such as mental health and desire and health and faith and what it means to be joyful, um, what it means to have a career uh, while being caste marginalized. I simply did not have or know of narratives that I can sort of hold on to, that I can use as a handrail. Um, narratives that are not suffocating but at the same time narratives that are helping that are supportive i did not have those narratives um and so a lot of my writing was for example um a recent piece of writing my most recent piece of writing really is uh titled notes on dissonance which i wrote for the magazine work um which is my first uh, uh long read on on desire and, and, and 
how desire as a concept has been constructed and what kind of evolutions it has had and how do how do dalit women approach it um how do i as a dalit woman approach it so um what i am so my book would be similar in that regard that i'm trying to articulate what it means to be this person uh not just personally but also anyone who can resonate with my experience uh what it means to be living this life and what it means to be navigating a world that is talking about career and identity and feminism and sisterhood and family and politics and desire and faith and joy what it how how do you make sense of this world really i think um i keep going back to what tony morrison said like if there's a book that you want to read and it's not available you must be the one to write it um and i'm writing this book uh primarily to make sense of this world um and hopefully it will help someone else as well and uh i hope that someone else is someone like me who's a dalit woman yeah the book is going to be uh, epic i must say because uh, what i feel like that uh, uh your story is really inspiring you have gone through so much you have seen so much you have moved from one place to another place you have seen everything i mean the book must be a must read i must say so moving ahead really kind yeah so as you know everything is today's world is data driven and your background is in technology and external relations you likely possess valuable insights into how technology can play a transformative transformative role in advancing social justice and empowering marginalized communities how do you envision technology contributing to positive change in this realm yeah i think um it's one of the questions that uh, we want to definitely explore within um uh, gcdw um because for me uh my primary objective is to is for the violence against dalit women to stop right we have to find a way to eliminate violence against dalit women as well as dalit queer people um because this violence has been ongoing for hundreds and hundreds of years and none of the systems have been able to fully eliminate it so i am fully aware that technology cannot play the role of providing systemic solutions but if there are technology solutions out there that can help in some way to to alleviate the pain that comes from this violence or to minimize this violence or provide the infrastructure for survivors and families of victims then i'm happy to explore um that route so in fact this i was talking to someone a couple of days ago as to this is one of the biggest um interventions that we want to invest our energies in going forward and hopefully this is something that we can take up um in about a year's time i mean in the, in the next year really to see what who, which kind of providers are out there what kind of technologies are out there that can help survivors of um caste violence either in terms of in 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 some way in which they can um get the uh, get the complaint going in redressal in in some form or the other um the second thing that i hope technology will help us with is um you know in in diversity equity and inclusion there's a lot of debate there's a lot of scholarship around it um so i'm 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 also really um curious to understand how can uh, ai for example or how can any of the other uh, solutions that we have in place right now or even the solutions that we are um 
that we are innovating can help us with better caste-based diversity, equity, and inclusion, can make our jobs easier in terms of addressing some of these complexities that we've not able to do as, as human beings manually. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what kind of uh, solutions we can we can think of as far as past day is concerned. So as you are the writer and working on your book, your contribution to various estimated publication have had significant impact. Is there any particular mm. piece of writing that holds a special place in your heart? So if so, what makes it especially meaningful to you? Uh, I think I already mentioned my most recent piece, Notes on Dissonance. I think um, that piece, more than it being special, I think it's one of the pieces that I am very proud of because um, I not only did I work quite hard on it, I also really, it, it felt like I had, I took a chunk out of, it took a chunk out of me because I had to really weave in my personal, my political and all kinds of aspects in the article. Um, also, it was my first long read. So uh, it, it gave me a lot of confidence towards writing my book. Um, and uh, I would encourage uh, people to read it. I, uh, I Hopefully people will like it and gain something from it. Yeah, I have also gone through that and I must say our audience uh, should go through that piece of reading. So having worked across diverse regions like India, China, Singapore and Netherlands, you might have encountered com common challenges faced by minority community or marginalized community. Could you elaborate on some of these challenges and how they might differ or intersect across various contexts? Um, I think in general... Um... And I think Audrey Lord talks about this uh, in quite in quite a detail. Um, is that across the board we have seen police brutality that has increased uh, so much so, um, and particularly the types of police brutality that has increased in the name of protecting the vulnerable, in the name of protecting the marginalized, in the name of freedom, in the name of women's safety. Um, and in so doing, they continue to keep criminalizing these very communities that they are trying to protect, that they claim that they are trying to protect. So I think that has been one of the learnings that we have, uh, that I have also sort of observed and gained over the last few years. It's that other marginalized communities, um, I mean, the systems uh are all learning from each other in regard to that, in regard to how to keep marginalized populations under control, A, and two, how do you manipulate and cheat marginalized populations into believing that these systems are for their benefit? So I think across context, this is a commonality. Um, the second thing that I have noticed is how you know, when it comes to systems such as capitalism and caste and racism, um, these systems are very happy to work extremely well with each other. And I was again mentioning this to someone a couple of days ago is that we tend to think that systems are very rigid, but in reality, they are not. They are extremely malleable. They are extremely adaptable. So they keep folding into one another. Um, often there is this conversation around decolonizing and not so much on de -Brahmanizing. But we have to understand how caste works along with colonialism, how decolonizing -colon must go in line with de um, And so some of these things are, again, common when you see across cross context, you often find that systems have find a way of coming back, even though uh, we, we've been putting forward several uh, discourses of radical, of radical uh, substance. Despite that, we keep seeing systems have a way of holding into these and coming back and, you know, manipulating us. So that's, again, something that I have noticed across contexts. Yeah. And something we need to be vigilant about. 
so is your mission and motto is to empower the dalit women mainly so empowering dalit women through self led and self sustained collective is inspiring for all dalit mm-hmm. women around the world we would love mm-hmm. to hear about some success stories of women who have benefited from your initiative and how it has positively impacted their lives and communities um i like i said this initiative is a new initiative so i won't be able to provide specific success stories but i can definitely speak to the overall success that our initiative is looking to achieve um one of the things that we are we've taken on is um a so an ambedkarite social cafe that we have in delhi which is led by anju singh uh, my colleague and fellow founder member of gcdw and anju has been doing some excellent work over the last many years and uh, she continues to do that in social cafe and what this ambedkarite social cafe aims to do is basically have young dalit women and dalit girls be part of a physical space where they have the opportunity to talk about their own individual and collective futures um they get to talk about the digital skills that they need uh what kind of ideologies that they that that appeals to them uh what kind of careers that they want to aspire towards uh and these conversations that we have seen in the last uh, few months have been extremely inspirational because uh we continue to realize time and time again that very simple things such as having a training program or having a 3 day workshop or even having um a, a personal one on one conversation with them especially if you happen to be a resourceful person can 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 reap huge benefits for them individually because they are able to they are not only inspired but are also extremely motivated and they are they are filled with a lot of curiosity to do many things and uh, i would like to highlight the most recent training program that anju conducted in delhi where we had uh, close to 30 women turn up young dalit women turn up and talk about ambedkarism and talk about you know what they want to do with their lives and what kind of uh, skills that they want to uh, seek and you know build for themselves and these are women who are uh, who are from extremely deprived contexts extremely poor contexts uh, and who are not getting the kind of training and getting the kind of assurance that their upper caste peers are getting so such interventions that uh, gcdw is working towards particularly what anju is doing in the social cafe uh, goes a long way for them and our hope is that we will continue to be able to monitor and continue to be able to give them that sort of infrastructure they need um over the next few years till the point that they are that they that they are able to be independent and do what they want to do so as you are the full package for our audience to listen as you have gone from place to place you have written so much and so, uh, so much and so about about the things and you know how technology works so in last what message you want to give to our audience to hear what i want to really say is that if you happen to come from a dalit social location uh, or you are an ambedkar right um and if you are and I, i i can't assume that you're struggling i can't assume that you are uh not struggling but whatever be your um state or whatever be your mindset at the moment i pray and hope that you will be able to find joy and you will be able to live a life that is full and that is in every way human and uh joyous and celebratory in the way you would you dream and particularly to you uh heman i hope and pray that you are able to achieve your big dreams um through sarim and uh, future and your future endeavors as well if you happen to be someone who's from an upper caste location i i hope you find uh, you found this conversation useful 
and I hope that you will have it in you to uh, look into your own personal history and your own family histories and see what you can do both as an individual as well as you know uh, being part of collectives and organizations and communities as to what kind of reparations you should engage in what kind of constructive solidarity that you can you can engage in and what kind of practical steps that you can take in order to um, further the anti-caste cause. Uh, that's really a beautiful and touching message from you. And secondly, I hope uh, listeners will get away many things from you that you speak about. And thank you very much for taking your time out for this interview. The conversation is really eye-opening for our audience. Mm, I look forward for many, many webinars and interview upcoming with you. And I must say, once you finish writing your book, we will have a review interview on that. Hopefully. Thank you, thank you so much, Heyman. I really appreciate your kind words. And thank you so much for having me. Such an honor and good luck with everything that's coming your way. Yeah, thank you.